Welcome everyone to this talk. It's a special talk today because we have Father Conroy, who is the parish priest at St Patrick's uh, Church in Dumbarton, um, to give, a, well, to have an interview with him, to talk about his experience um, of the priesthood and to get some insights into what it's like um, being a priest and to look at some of his background, to inform us about his, his life and his, his career, if you like, in the priesthood. So, Father, you're very much welcome. Thank you. Just as a kind of opening easy question uh, for you, because I mean, it's all about you at the end of the day, so hopefully these questions are, are easy enough. Could you maybe tell us about your early years um, and your background? Well, I was, I was born in the east coast of Scotland, and, um, but we moved here um, when I was about six with my father's work. I attended St. Patrick's McLean Place um, and I made the first, first confession, as it was then known, and uh, First Holy Communion and Confirmation here in St. Patrick's. Um, so I, I was kind of surprised, I must say, when the bishop asked me to move here because that was quite unusual and I've been here um, about 13 years now, 14 years going on, coming up for 14 years now um, since that. And so, when did you join um, Junior Seminary, Father? At, after the, the primary school, I went to the, the Junior Seminary, which was in Lang Bank. I was there for two years. And then um, the next four years, it was in Blair's College up in Aberdeen. So, and that was... So, that was the six years of secondary school. And when you, you know, joined the junior seminary, um, I think you were 12, about 12 years old, is that right, Father? Yeah, yeah, 11 or 12, 1970 it was, so. Was that quite a, for you, quite a big decision? Because it's a very, very young age, uh, by anyone's reckoning. So how, how did that come about? It was, well, it was kind of strange, I suppose. Um, my brother had gone to seminary, um, before me, he's two two years before me, and I was sort of thinking of what I wanted to do. There were a few people, I think, because I came from a, a Catholic background, and St Patrick's had a, a sort of a tradition of people going and studying for the priesthood. There were quite a few um, had, had gone from the parish, and I think somebody asked me, "Do I want to go?" And I, that sort of didn't have the faintest inkling. Of, you know, inclination towards it. Um, so I'd said no. And then I was quite young, so I had to repeat primary seven. And um, I suppose you were getting to that stage as you do in primary seven, where you're starting to look forward to the high school and you're sort of feeling, well, I'm sort of growing up now and becoming a man now, you know, all of 11 years old. And I suppose it was a kind of daunting thing and you start to think, well, what's it going to be like? And I decided one of the things that I had to do was sort of um, grow up a little bit. And part of growing up for me was, um, at that time I was, I sang in the choir in St. Patrick's and this, that's quite a big choir. So I decided that part of going to secondary school would involve me leaving the choir. So... Um, I told my mum and dad I didn't want to be in the choir anymore. And um, and that, it was a, a Sunday. So the, we went to benediction. At that time, I think there was benediction in the e Sunday evening. And the, the priest happened to be speaking about vocations and the need for vocations. And something just clicked with me. Mm. And that was it. And that was it. And... For you, has it been um, quite plain sailing through those early years? I mean, you were, you know, at Junior Seminary, then you went up to Blair's. Was there ever that kind of period whereby there was ups and downs with your faith? And maybe, you know, in your formative years, you may have started to question things. Or, you know, was there any ups and downs? Or did you always feel that you were moving in, the, in one direction? I would say... The questioning, a serious questioning came later. Um, I, I didn't particularly enjoy 
my time in the junior seminaries, I have to say. Um, but perhaps I was a bit stupid and didn't think there was any other way for me to go. Yeah. There was there any other way to, to do this? So I, I asked, I think, on a, a few occasions if that was really what I wanted to do and what, you know, if, if I still wanted to do that. And the answer was, yes, it, it was what I wanted to do. It was what I wanted to do as well, which, you know, I think was an important um, realisation for me. Um, and so although it wasn't the happiest of time in the secondary school for me, um, it wasn't something I particularly enjoyed, um, that experience. It was something I decided it was just... That was the way to go for me. And when you went to Blair's, what was what was the 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 routine like? You know, what was the experience like? I mean, how, I presume you had mass every day. There was yeah, there was mass every day. I, I mean, that's a long time ago. You're asking me now to, to remember that. So, as, as far as it, well, you got up in the morning. I think you had morning prayer. Sometimes you had mass in the morning. Sometimes in the evening. As far as I remember. Um, Classes started at nine, and they went on until lunchtime. Then um, there was usually a break until, um, I think, maybe two or three. And you were encouraged to get out of the building. Then there was some afternoon classes. Then there was a, another break. Sometimes there was football or things like that, other sports. Um, then there was a study period, and, and that was evening meal, and, and then bed, I suppose. That was mm -hmm. it. That's my memory of it. Yeah. yeah. It was, I suppose it was a very structured, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. at that time there would have been, um, I think, well over 100 young boys in, in one building, so I suppose they had to have it quite structured or there would have been me again. <laughs> <laughs> of course. And, and when did you... You moved to the Scots College in Rome. That was in 1976. Then I moved. To, so once I'd finished um, sixth year, um, it, there were three possibilities really. There was a college in Cardross, which um, is now closed, but and then there was one in um, Spain and one in Rome. So I was um, sent to Rome. Yeah, and what and what was that experience like? Did you feel that when you got to Rome, the serious study had to commence, or was it more of a gradual process? I really enjoyed my time in Rome. I enjoyed my time in Rome because of the weather, which was <laughs> glorious. Because there was lots of football. I think I can remember distinctly between. Um, when was it? it would have been between the, um, October and December. We had 46 games of football. I remember that. So, right. And then there was the study on top of that, which was, it was interesting. But I think it, 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 it sort of, it gradually, I think, became more interesting for me. Yeah. So, and so, I mean, and food, I should mention the food as well. The food was of course. very good. Yeah. So, <laughs> and, to be honest, the study wasn't the sort of the prime focus of my attention at that point. Right. Uh, I hear more you. the football and the food and things like that. Oh, well. So. When, when you did start to get to the academic stuff, was, mm. there a, was there a particular kind of aspect of study that drew you in more so obviously you have some priests that are into the kind of canon law direction you've got others that are interested yeah. on the theology side for you which did you have a, a mix of interests or did you feel that there was a particular line um, of inquiry that you you like to pursue i think first of all uh, the, the way that the course was structured it was the first two years you studied philosophy then there was a three-year course, on a basic theology course, and then there was a, another couple of years after that anyway, in which he specialised and, and did what they called a licence. 
So at, by the time the philosophy was was going on, um, but that I drew to a close. I was quite interested in a lot of that. The theology then, um, I enjoyed, and I think I enjoyed it more as the time went on, um, because it, it became more speculative, or, or you know, and, and I suppose to some extent more philosophically based as well. Mm -hmm. um, and at the the point um, after the third, after you finished your um, three years of theology, that you'd have a, a word with the bishop, and the bishop would say what he wanted you to do, right? Because there were different specialisations, and the, the sort of the, the diocese is the diocese needed different ones. So I, I went in expecting to do canon law because all the other students in the in the year who had who were from Glasgow had all been given their specialisations. I was the last one in, and the only one that was left was canon law. Mm. So when I went in to see the cardinal, um, it was the archbishop at that point, um, I, I was expecting to be told to do canon law, and he said, no, I want you to do scripture. So that was a shock. It was also meant that the normal specialisations, two years, scripture was four years. Right. So um, that I went back and I, I did scripture. And I must say, I thoroughly enjoyed it. It was really, um, it, it was... Yeah, it was, it was very enjoyable. Challenging as well, but very enjoyable. And how often... And the, 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 the scripture, of course, it was language-based. It was pr principally... I mean, you did the first two years, you basically just did nothing but languages. Right. Um, and then the, and the, the way the course was set out, it was more... It wasn't so much imparting knowledge as imparting methodology mm. of how to to deal with languages and, and uh, texts and the, the biblical texts in particular. Mm -hmm. And at that time, how often were you allowed to come home uh, to see your family and things like that? At the, at the beginning, when I first went out there, so say for the first five, five or six years, yeah, first six years, I think, you were only allowed home at summer. Right. So it, Christmas, that you were sort of told to get out of the college and go and um, discover Italy. Right. And you weren't allowed out of Italy. Um, and then at Easter as well, you were encouraged to get out. Um, and, and at that time, I suppose, I mean, that time I, we were very fortunate because there were government grants for students, so we didn't have debts. So I suppose we were more comfortable off than students would be nowadays. Yeah. Um, and, and so we had a bit of pocket money. I remember going up to Venice the first Christmas um, and we didn't have any place to stay. And um, we, we went to the local tourist office and they sort of just looked at us as if we were idiots, which we probably were going to Venice and not having any place to stay. And so they, they sort of said to us, well, um, how much have you got to spend? So we told them, and so they, I think they, they just sort of thought we're wasting their time. But one person was very good, and they, they found us a place in Hotel Rialto. Right. So you know the Rialto Bridge, yeah. and you go to the Rialto, and if you see this hotel, it's, it's a five-star hotel. But it wasn't quite a five-star when we went there, and we went in, but we thought we'd landed, you know, <laughs> in, in a lap of luxury. So they took us up to this room, which was an old cupboard, they take the brushes out to put us in. But it, it was a centre of Venice, so it was very good. So that, I mean, it was, I suppose it was just a great experience in many ways. And, you know, at that time as well, when, when I went out in 1976, not a lot of people could afford to travel yeah. um, abroad that way. And so we were very fortunate. Yeah. And, you know, you could see, you, you saw a different, a different side of life, a different site, different culture, really. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, um, it, it was. It wasn't. The world wasn't as connected then as it is now. Yeah, absolutely. And thinking back to, you know, the um, the fellow students that you're with at that time, mm -hmm. you know, I presume you develop friendships um, throughout your time, and in your experience. Were you one of the few that completed the course? You know, did others kind of fall away? 
it was it difficult when that happens, particularly if you had made friends? Yeah, I, I think when I, in my year when we started, um, there were 10 in Rome and five were ordained right. from that year. So whenever someone left, I always made you stop and think, well, am I sort of, do I still want to continue? Is this important for me enough to, to stay? Yeah, so. yeah absolutely. And, and then after you finished your studies, um, you had your ordination. What, what was that? What were your memories of, of your ordination? What was it like? Um, I think... To be honest, I would just that after the you did two years philosophy, three years of theology, then you did your specialization. After the first year of specialization, in the course of that, you were ordained a deacon. Yeah. And I think that was that's the big step in many ways, rather than priesthood. Um, it, it, because that's when you make the commitment to celibacy and you know that. So you really have to think about it at that point. And I remember. Um, a tragic, it was, I suppose to some extent, what age would you have been, been 22, 23 maybe. Um, so you're, you're still young, you think you're an adult, you think you know things. Yeah. Um, but I think um, at that period in my life, um, my sister had cancer. So things weren't great. Um, and then there was another student who committed suicide. Right. And we get told that on when we were doing a, a retreat before the diaconate. And that, I think, really um, changed my whole perspective on life and, and the way that I approached life and questioned life. Um, you know, it's something, some great tragedy like that, that impinges um, on your life and, and makes you realise what's going on, that we didn't see this was happening in this other person's life. Um, and how could it happen? How could God allow that such a thing to happen? How could, you know, it, wouldn't he protect them? And especially some, somebody that was, you know, wanting to be a priest. So that was, a, a, I think, um, a very important moment in my own journey. And, and it sort of shook me out of any kind of complacency that I had. Um, and so I think that was that was a significant one. The the run to priesthood, if I can put it that way, is is you know it was it was different. It's it's not that you're thinking, but you've really made your decision by then. So you you've got time to to enjoy more um, what's coming up in priesthood, and you've not got a lot of time to be honest because you're doing exams, and I think your exams finished halfway through June, and I was ordained on the twenty fifth of June. So your your mind is focusing on one thing and then switching to the other. But a lot of the the real thinking about it you've been doing throughout your, your time there. And if you don't mind me asking you about that, because that sounds, sounds like a terrific time. You know, your, your sister being very gravely ill and, you know, and then obviously there was a suicide as well. Um, you know, you said that in some ways that made, that kind of change your perspective. And, and you said that, you know, it makes you question, well, why would God allow that to happen to someone that wants to become a priest? How did you get through that? You know, how, how did you process all that? I, I think the way that I processed it, I don't know if this is the way that everybody processes it, but I think it brought me to a fork in my road. So I had to make a choice of what I wanted to do with my life how I wanted to approach life. Basically, did I want to be someone who looked on life negatively, who approached life negatively, or did I want to maintain a kind of positivity about life, to say, no, that life is good, that it's not all darkness, that it, you know, that it's, it's light that is the main thing. And that was the choice that I had to make. And, and that was a choice as well of saying, well, do I want to believe or do I not want to believe? And I said, no, I want to believe. Mm -hmm. So that, that's not to say that everything then resolved itself. 
And when I said that, it gave me a different perspective on life. I think at 22, you know, you're not, you're not mature. You think you are. 23, you're not mature. It takes time. But it, it sets you on a particular way of approaching life and the questions that you ask about life, the answers that you try to, to find about life um, are, are given that perspective. And for the rest of your journey through life, I think, um, you know, you're, you're still trying to, to fit things together in a particular way. Mm -hmm. um, to, but it, I, think, I, th I think for most people who have, you know, after a certain age, you do experience tragedy mm -hmm. and it makes you question. It does. And I think, well, it's, it, how do you answer that? How do you respond to it? Some people, I think, just can't find an answer and just shut down. And they just don't want to, to think about it. Other people think about it and say it and grapple with it for the rest of their life and can't, can't find a resolution to, to the problems and questions that they're asking. I think I was one who decided, this is what I'm going to do. And the questions will keep occurring to me and I'll keep looking to find a better answer or a, a more um, satisfactory answer. Mm -hmm. and what, an answer that I can live with mm -hmm. and I think that is, is how life then has gone on mm -hmm. and I think that has um, that's affected how I approach life and how I've matured hopefully in the course of life Yeah and one of the things that I think is probably one, one of your signature phrases that you of, I often hear you say and I don't know if you realise you say it um, but in mass you often talk about how we journey through life you say that quite a lot. Mm. You talk about the journey of faith. And I think mm. that kind of talks to some of that as well. And it's also mm. the fact that it's only you that can truly make that, that decision if you're at a fork in the road. Yeah, it is. I mean, there's, there's this phrase about uh, faith seeking understanding. You know, and, and I think for a lot of people, they think that people of faith have feel that they've got all the answers, that they're static, they're stuck there. Mm -hmm. But I think what faith is about is about this journey of, of understanding life, understanding yourself, understanding just what is this whole experience of existence about. Mm -hmm. Now, you could say that about everything. Mm -hmm. A lot of people ask that without faith. Faith is, is one way of, of seeking the answer, I think. Yeah. And and then, you know, you made the decision, you, you came to that fork in the road, which was not easy and took time to mature through it. When you did complete your studies and then you were ordained to the priesthood, can you remember what that day was like when you were ordained? Just a very happy day, you know, a very joyous day. I think that's again. It's a few years ago now. So. Yeah, it was it Cardinal Winning. It was, yeah. It was the Archbishop at the time? But yeah, he was oh, he yeah. was the, the ordaining prelate, as they say. Yeah. Um, there were two of us actually ordained together. There was another Father John McGrory. We were ordained at the same time and together, because he's also a, a parishioner he, or was. Right. Okay. Okay. And. And then after that, what happened? Like, what was your journey from from that point? You know, did you, you did you go to a, a parish straight away to, to to work, or did you do other things? No, I, I returned to Rome to finish the studies. So I was ordained in nineteen eighty two, and I, I came back having finished the studies in eighty five. Um, I came back and was appointed to uh, Saint Peter's in Partick, right, and. I think I was there about four years and also um, taught part-time in the, um, the seminary, right. taught scripture part-time in the seminary. And St. Peter's in part of that time, it was, a, it was a big parish, there were another three priests in the house um, and it was also at that time it, it had the school, primary school, and help look after the, the Western Infirmary as well as the chaplain there. So it was it was a good experience and very varied 
players. Mm. And I think that's important. The variety is important um, in, in a priest's life. Yeah. Yeah. And, and kind of thinking a bit, a bit more uh, broadly, you know, about that, and because I mean, that variety is important. So, is there such a thing as an average day in the life of a priest, or could it just fluctuate so much? I think to a great extent, you write your own timetable, right. and there are certain things that are fixed. So, there's time for prayer, there's, there's the time for mass. Um, if, if you're involved in a school, if there's a primary school in the parish, you, you know, you, you go into the school. Um, I suppose here I go try, well, before all this started, COVID, there was two mornings a, a week went in. Um, you visit the sick um, and, and other groups and things as well that are going on in the parish. Mm. Um, so. and, and just kind of thinking, I mean, we've talked in our book reviews, um, one of the kind of key themes that often comes up is, is issues to do with modern culture and modern society. Mm -hmm. And society is very different now to when it was when you were training to become a priest. And I was just kind of wondering whether or not um, the the work of a priest has, has changed over the years. So, you know, being a priest back in the 80s compared to now, has there been a shift in terms of what a priest is expected to do, the, the types of work that you undertake? I think when, well, when I was ordained, as, as I said, the first parish we went into, there were four priests in the parish. And I think most parishes had more than one priest. So that has made a big difference because it means that you don't have the same amount of time that you might have had previously to dedicate to, to any one particular um, field or topic or you know, group. So you're, you're spread more thinly that way. But I think essentially it, it's, you're still dealing with people. Yeah. Um, and people, well, have they changed? And they haven't, people haven't changed. As you said, the culture has changed. Mm -hmm. And that has made a difference to how people respond, I think, to faith, to religion. Um, and to priests. Um, and so to that extent, you have to find different ways of, of communicating what you're, you're trying to communicate. Mm. Yeah. And you mentioned that, you know, years ago, it would be the case that you'd be sharing um, a, a house with other priests mm. and, and now you, you live on your own um, in St. Mm. Patrick's. And, I was just kind of thinking, can it, can it sometimes get lonely or are you just too busy to get lonely? Um, you're, you're, you're busy. I think loneliness comes when you are looking for something you don't have. And I think... Um, I've been fortunate in my priesthood that I've never really been looking for something that I didn't have. Mm -hmm. Sure. I think I think loneliness is an absence of something that you feel you need or you want or you should have. Um, and basically, I suppose loneliness is an absence of of other people in your life, and you know you feel the lack of that. Um, and I think I've been fortunate. I've been in parishes where there have been other priests that have offered um, human company. I've always been in parishes where people have supported me. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I think also I feel that the, the vocation of priesthood itself means that I'm not looking for um, that external um, human contact. That, that might lead to loneliness, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess you just have to be comfortable in, in, your, own, in your own company, you know. Yeah. In your own company. And I'm very comfortable in my own company. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly not a bad thing. Uh, and, and just kind of um, thinking through about, you know, your experience of other priests, being friends with other priests and 
knowing other priests in your own journey too. If you if you've got a young a young man or or not <laughs> doesn't necessarily have to be young anymore because you know of course you can join the priesthood later in life and people do, mm. but if you are sitting down with someone who came to you and said, Father, I'm interested in, in becoming a priest. What kind of advice would you give them? Or even what kind of characteristics would you be looking for? I guess what I'm trying to say is, and it's a difficult question because we're all different, but what makes a, a good priest, if you know what I mean? I think in, in our society, um, it has to, the person has to be mature. I think they have to have thought about their life and what they want out of their life. Um, and I suppose the vocation of priesthood arises out your baptismal vocation. So they have to have thought about their faith and know what their faith is about and, and understand that that too is a vocation. Um, and have decided that they want to live their baptismal vocation in this particular way of, of the priesthood. Because there's, you know, there are different ways, like a marriage is a vocation and you're living out your baptismal yeah. um, vocation in, in marriage. And that's just as important a way as, as the priesthood. But it's, it's got to be, uh, I suppose, just that particular understanding that it's a way of living out what we're all called to do. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's not it's not something that you do because you can't find anything else to do. You know, it, it's it's this is you know something that the person wants to do because they understand their Christian vocation. Mm -hmm. Right. And and can I just ask in this this is something that you might, you might not be you might, I don't know if you have thought about it or what but is there times when you for example being part of the Catholic Church it is such a huge entity and there's so many rules dogmas and so on have, have there been times in your life as a priest when you feel that sometimes the church has got in the way sometimes of your ministry and in terms of what you've been seeking to do but by the church do you mean the institution the institution of the church right um no i i can't say that i would say that there are times when i've felt that individuals priests and and others have um made the gospel difficult for people mm -hmm. and I suppose that's how I've done that as well I suppose you know I think it's it is a human failing but I can't say that I've ever disagreed with the church's teaching on anything mm -hmm. I found it times challenging and difficult both personally and, and seeing it other people trying to live it in their lives and but I think it is the truth and it leads to something um, greater and to, I suppose, a more full humanity. Mm -hmm. I believe that. And it's just that I think where we have failed in different ways, um, and I wouldn't say as the church, but because it's individuals that fail. Um, I think where we have failed is that we have not managed to help people on their journey of faith um, to grow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I wouldn't say, I, I don't want to, I don't, I'm not into blaming institutions for anything. Mm -hmm. No, it, it, it's, it's people that do that. Yeah. And I think we just have to take responsibility for that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And just kind of a slightly different tact, you know, what what kind of things do you like to do to, to relax in your life? I mean, obviously you have a very busy life being a priest, but what, what's, do you have any hobbies and things you like to, to do to chill out a little bit? Um, I, I enjoy listening to music, enjoy reading. Um, and I suppose 
I think that the days of physical activity are, are sort of in the past for me now. <laughs> um, I used to, I, mean, I suppose I played a lot of football and squash went up hills when I was younger. Yeah. Not that mould, you understand, but no, you know that. No. So, so now I'd like to say they're more sedentary pastimes. <laughs> Fair enough. And uh, if, you, if you're looking back, like, I know that, you, you know, becoming a priest is, 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 is obvious, but being a priest is, is something that's just been part of your life from a, from 12 years old, you were on that, that path. Mm -hmm. But if you didn't follow that path, what type of career you might have, do you think you might have followed if you weren't a priest? Well, I think when I was when I was twelve, before I decided that I was going to go to seminary, I can remember that I thoroughly enjoyed reading um, C.S. Forrester and the Hornblower series of books. So, when before I, I decided that I was going to uh, try out to be a priest, I was going to join the navy because I was captivated by that whole thing and. Um, I think later on, and when I was in secondary school and, and thinking about things, if that was what I was going to do, wanted to do, um, I, I think it was considering then being a psychiatrist or something. Yeah. Um, but I, th I think that was it, really. Those were the two main options for me. Yeah. Well, maybe not joining the Navy, but I think perhaps being a psychiatrist for people is part of your life as well I'd imagine at times yeah, in terms of... I, I, yeah I suppose it uh, comes in every now and again yeah 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 well, well that's been really interesting father uh, is there anything that you'd like to offer that I've not asked and that people might be surprised to hear about you that I've not covered no I don't think I'm a very surprising person <laughs> so I can't think of anything that would surprise anyone no problem. Well, it's been really good. Thanks for joining us and uh, for sharing uh, some of your insights uh, from your journey, Father. I found it very interesting, so thank you. Thank you.